Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up? And welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris. And I am here with my older brother. Wesley. Today we're reviewing a movie from 1992. What's it called? You've been bugging me for months to review The Bodyguard. Or, as it is called in Japan, Yojimbo. (laughs) Not to be confused with Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Which was released in the U.S., as the bodyguard. <laughs> I have not been bugging you for months. I asked you this week. Is it because it was on HBO Max where it is currently available? Yes. I don't believe I have seen the bodyguard for over 20 years. Uh, maybe 30 years. Is that possible? Nope. 1992. Actually, almost. I don't believe I've revisited the bodyguard in my adulthood. But when I saw it on HBO Max, I was intrigued I've seen The Bodyguard maybe a couple of times since its release. You know, it shows up here and there on cable. But I found out that this was Kelly's first ever rated R movie in the theater. And uh, so she remembered it like that, like being kind of daring and and sexy, even though there was no no sex. Whitney Houston was only going to go as far as swearing, I guess. A surprisingly chaste love scenes between these two, considering how much incredible chemistry they have. This hasn't been like one of those return to guilty pleasure type movies, but in the last week I have been obsessed with The Bodyguard. (laughs) You watch it more than once? I watched it once indulgently and then I kind of was like watching it again under the guise of research and you know preparing for this review, but really I just wanted to see that sweet courtship scene between the two of them at the Honky Tonk Bar. (laughs) The Honky Tonk. It occurs to me at the moment that this is somewhere in the Tom Hanks era, Meg Ryan era of romantic comedies too, Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail. And in a way, I'm trying to figure out why this feels very much like a 90s, early 90s movie, particularly, I guess it's an action, not comedy, (laughs) it's like a romance movie, like a love story. In the same way that Action Jackson seemed very fitting in the 80s, this one seems like perfectly set in the 90s. The 90s were filled with films that were thoroughly entertaining, but like not exactly high art. Like this movie gets a lot of flack for, I don't really know what, actually. Maybe for not being a totally serious film, but it's like really entertaining, right? Or am I crazy? I mean, is it serious because it's light? It is Whitney Houston's first acting role. And you would think that that's not serious or whatever, but it starts off really strong. Like it's a gripping drama where he's just killed someone in service of the person he's protecting. And it doesn't start off like a romance. That's for sure. (laughs) It doesn't. Oh, my God. Speaking of that beginning. Wait a second. That beginning messed my whole night up, by the way. Okay. So it's virtually silent over the opening credits. Right. And I'm like, man, the stupid speaker's out again. And I'm like pumping up the volume. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, bam, 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 like these three shots ring out. (laughs) And I'm like fumbling for the remote, like immediately trying to turn it down. And both the girls start crying. (laughs) And I'm like, seriously, like I just sat down for movie night. Thankfully, from there, the movie picks up almost immediately. Like the movie establishes Kevin Costner as kind of a badass and as a bodyguard. Yep. And then you immediately cut to the Devaney recruitment scene. And then three to five minutes later, he's already driving on to the Marin estate. Yep. And I appreciated that the movie just like got right to it. Yep, got right to it. Really serious, really honest and factual. The atomic number of zinc is in fact 30 as confirmed by Alexa. <laughs> Uh, That's what he said, proving that the intercom couldn't hear what he was saying anyway because of their their shoddy security. Yeah, that's what Henry Ford claimed, that it was actually factually true. Right. It feels like it should be regarded seriously, but you're right. It has... I think because it was so huge, people mocked it a little bit after the fact. I Will Always Love You is kind of cheesy. Uh, Kevin Costner has said, like, around Whitney Houston's funeral that that song continues to be a ringtone on his phone and he considers it a badge of honor when he gets mocked for it 
because it's just too big. I mean, this is the era of Kevin Costner being a big thing. Fantastic back to back to backs. Maybe not critically, but Dances with Wolves certainly was. And that was two years before and then The Bodyguard. And then Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Come on, that dude was the man in the early 90s. But Robin Hood also had the cheesiest theme song like of all times. The Brian Adams, Everything I Do, I Do It For You high school song. That was like that was like our school. You. That was like our school dances. Not that I went to those, but that was like the the big theme at the end of the night. You were hating on Kevin Hotner during the JFK review, a movie that you adore. What you got against Kevin Hotner? Well, his drony monotone delivery works well, I think, in the courtroom. Obviously, he's been derided for his lack of accent in Robin Hood. I like watching Kevin Costner for some reason. He's imposing, seeming, while also being kind of doofy. Totally doofy. But but he's convincing as a tough guy, as a, as a bodyguard who's skilled, you know, in a Liam Neeson kind of slightly faded kind of way. Like, you believe it because he doesn't have to demonstrate at all times how tough he is. But I got to say, particularly in the scene that you love in the honky-tonk bar, as you called it, when he's trying to be, like, kind of cute, Aww. he's so doofy. The part of me that wants to believe their romance is, like, reveling in how innocent and cute it is. But then the cynical part of me is, like, is this just sport for her? Does she just want to land him to see if she can? I mean, as evidenced by the fact that she goes for exactly the wrong bodyguard type at the party. Of all the people that you could jump on to make Farmer jealous, the lazy eye murderer <laughs> one is the one you're... Man, <laughs> like she she ditched the party of which she was the leader and like into some random side bedroom to make out with that dude. Oh, she was on a mission to rip out Farmer's heart. Do you remember what she says the moment before she whisks away the droopy eye murderer guy? Well, other than like, let's get a drink, a real one. She says, what do you do? And he's like, same thing that Farmer does. And she's like, mm, two samurai. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's messing with him like so shamelessly totally but he, what does he have he has his toughness and his skill set but it's not like he i mean obviously he's trying to get away from his client and not get involved because it would compromise his ability to protect her but he's so like there's not that's not an accident it's not like he's a seductive playboy when he wants to be outside of his job and she's off limits he's pretty doofy and he could not be more wooden in the samurai scene with the sword and stuff and kelly looked at me and she's like you know what this scene is right you know it's going to happen, right? And I was like, yeah, the sword thing, the scarf thing. And she's like, the scarf thing, like it's legendary. Is it hot? Like It's like it's supposed to be dangerous and seductive. Right. That's all he's got. It's not like the way to a woman's heart is to like destroy her clothes with a sword. He's not charming <laughs> or anything. He's just kind of like some samurai. Like, I don't know if this was a style, if this was an intentional wardrobe choice or this is a casualty of the 90s, but he has the worst date night outfit on ever. Is it like the flannel and the tuck in into the khakis? Yeah. And it's like all baggy and saggy and obviously does not stack up to Rachel Marin, who's also very dressed down for her date night with her bodyguard. She's got a but silk scarf on. That's bougie. I mean, that's her little flair because she's Rachel Marin. But um, there's nothing about him that's, it's just it's just how charming he is. And when he's like, can you believe that? And she's like, uh, no, I can't. And she's like kind of honest, but also a little flirty about it. His little shy smile and look at her, I put uh. right up there with the Paul Rudd kiss at the end of Clueless. Man, as being spoiler. The best. Okay. He's, I mean, I don't know what you expect from him. He's literally a farmer. Have you seen his dad? His dad, <laughs> by the way, do you know what the dad's character's name is? No. He's Herb, aka Herb Farmer. <laughs> He's a Herb Farmer. A little, a uh, little on the nose there. Yeah. That, uh, that haircut is not a mistake. Kevin Costner based it on Steve McQueen, who was actually up for this role a long time before. The script had been floating around for a long time. And at one point, it was going to be Steve McQueen and Diana Ross. Like an entire generation earlier? Yeah. I don't know that it was a direct homage, but it was very close to the Steve, the Steve McQueen signature haircut. 
I don't know, this movie seemed to fit pretty squarely into this 90s vibe. Maybe it's musically, too, uh, the look of the music video, because a lot of her music features prominently, and, of course, Whitney Houston was the biggest thing next to Mariah Carey in the 90s. Still, by the way, the best-selling soundtrack, movie soundtrack of all time. There are varying reports, some as high as $45 million, but surpassing the Bee Gees for Saturday Night Fever is a big deal. The only Oscar attention this movie got was for two of the songs, which was, uh, I think it was Run to You and I Have Nothing. I Have Nothing was definitely one of them. And you wonder what the Academy would have thought, because the Academy had to have some participation, but it didn't make the Oscar ceremony look very good. Like buttoned down? It didn't make it look buttoned down and safe? Uh, yeah, I guess. It's just for a big centerpiece for a major named award, she was both in the movie an Oscar-winning actress and a fantastically successful singer. Would you say that Kevin Costner and Whitney Houston bring all kinds of context and baggage to this viewing of The Bodyguard? Like, isn't it hard to look at Whitney Houston and not think about the tragic end of her life when watching The Bodyguard? Doesn't it kind of color her performance for you? Um, obviously it's sad to see or to think about after the fact, but none of that was in play. She was as close to the Rachel Marin character as anyone could be. Kevin Costner said he actually, he was a producer on the movie. He was, you know, Oscar winner, and he actually lobbied for her to take the role. He said that anybody, almost anybody could have played Farmer, but nobody could have played Marin like Whitney Houston. And obviously one of the greatest singers of all time. However you feel about however cheesy I Will Always Love You is in retrospect or the path that she went down later in life, super talented. Evidenced by the fact she sits down next to her sister who's singing Jesus Loves Me and, and is perfectly lovely. And, and then Whitney Houston starts singing and you're like, you can tell it's a marked difference. It's like the opening band. You're like rocking out to the opening band and then the main act comes on stage and you're like, whoa, that's what it's supposed to sound like. And Whitney Houston was talented and I think held her own for her first movie role which was hugely prominent like she it's not like she has a guest starring appearance or something where she you know has a few lines and you're like oh look at that Whitney Houston's acting like this is full in your face in the camera and I think she did a, a pretty admirable job but by all accounts she was so close to the Rachel Marin character except that she was much sweeter and nicer and kinder and really a good person uh, Kevin Costner maintains. It doesn't seem to me that you could fake the kind of chemistry and connection that they had, even if it was platonic off the screen. It seems like they remained connected, you know, so much so that he spoke at her funeral. And it's silly, but it makes me feel kind of happy. But this movie makes me think about her entourage as well. You know, her fictitious entourage, they love her and they do everything out of love. Do they? But not always with the most practical application or uh. logic. And I wonder, like, as a real life person, was she surrounded with people who were helping her make good choices or who, who were enabling her out of love? When you're that level of famous and talented, it gets pretty insular. You're surrounded by yes men or yes people and you get whatever you want. And at the same time, those are kind of the only people that you really can practically be surrounded with. Because as nice as it is that Rachel Marin can just like, oh, I'm going to defy farmer's wishes and go to a club. We're going to it's it's a club, Frank. You know, duh, you don't know the name of this club. And they go, I'm not sure that that happens. Can Whitney Houston just kind of pop out and have lunch? I'm not sure. Or brunch every Sunday. Can, do you know, have you been to the Mayan? No. You haven't been to the Mayan? You haven't heard of the Mayan? I'm sorry. I'm not rich. <laughs> the, the Mayan's a club. It's a rock club, dude. Well, maybe I'll go like on a Tuesday or something. Well, no, I'm talking about the where she performs that night that's supposed to be dinner. Oh, yeah. Um. So I had to look up his name. It is Tony, right? Because like also that dude just looks like a Tony. <laughs> Tony <laughs> undoubtedly loves her. So yes. much so that he, he could get fired for trying to attack Farmer and for ruining a lot of the kitchen. But I don't know, that, man. Okay. That scene, I have to talk about that scene with you. Okay. That scene plus two lines from this movie were so familiar to me. Not having seen this movie for 20 years. I remember the the peach or whatever he's eating, you know, and you eat it all badass with your knife. And I remember the knife throwing and I remember Tony like backing off. This scene was like somehow seared into my memory. Yeah. And well shot. It goes handheld kind of shaky and it's scary and kind of uncertain because they're both good guys, I guess. And uh, he's already tottering on the edge, teetering 
on the edge of whether or not he's going to go through with this because she's being so difficult and he just had to extricate her from the club, you know, because she was reckless. I mean, she wasn't, re when people jump on stage, that's security's job. But it's true. People, if she gets too close, she could get hurt. And when you saw the creepo pop up, were you like, he's right there? It's hard to remember because obviously we thought we, the misdirect was that he was he was one of two. He was definitely a creep. But I remembered obviously who the bad guy was. And so that guy is just like a sad, hapless creep, hapless would be murderer because he was sending the letters. He just wasn't yeah. the one that said you're going to die. But he wasn't the right one that, that was trying to kill her. But I laughed be, because I remember that dude. Like you're talking about the things that trigger your memory, like the knife fight scene. I was watching the scene when he said it during this viewing. I went, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> to the cop. The creepiest. He's so, he's like the poor albino the actor or whatever. Dude, the poor Paul Bettany's of the world. Like, why <laughs> are the al albino? <laughs> he was only an albino in the Dan Brown movies. <laughs> I'm just saying, why, <laughs> why are the albinos the bad dudes? <laughs> So I remember that what I got from this viewing this time around, because I was going back to the, you know, this movie feels very much like a 90s movie and the sets and the music and the costumes and all that stuff. But also super like, is there a more 90s caricature in this movie than Psy, the manager? Oh, yeah. The PR guy. The irritating naysayer. Yeah. He's like the publicist or something. But despite knowing who the would be murderer is or the bad guy. So I felt suspect to me in this viewing in a way mm. that he never had before. Did you get the, any of that? I could see that. They were all so sycophantish. They were like, any of them could have been it, really. I mean, not Devaney, but. Because you missed my joke about going to the Mayan on Tuesday. <laughs> He's like, Tuesday morning brunch. Where'd you find this guy, Bill? He's all like <laughs> contemptuous of Farmer not being cool or hip in the 90s with his stupid Gavin Rossdale hair. In his Gavin Rossdale accent. I don't know, dude. Sai is the mouthpiece of truth in this movie because you can't do brunch on Tuesday morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> and also when he's like, we got a communication problem. And Kevin Costner appropriately goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> he proceeds to say, if she goes out there, you know, she might die. But if she doesn't go out there, she definitely will die. Dead anyway. Exactly. And I was like, you know what? Sai might be kind of a douche, but one, he's got a job to do. And two, he's not lying. Like he's speaking the truth. He's speaking the Rachel Marin truth out there. The Rachel Marin truth, I guess. But I mean, she's like, I'll do whatever you say. And he's like, no more Sai. And she, he disappears. Tony disappears. And, and she's still fine. She's fine. You're just Hollywood. Yeah. Well, what can I say? Let's talk about the Snow Cabin Retreat, because between that and the Hollywood Mansion, this feels very Hollywood. The herb farm? The er <laughs> When Farmer tackles Fletcher off the boat and Rachel and the family are like, he can't swim. Yeah. It made me think, what is Fletcher doing the entire movie before then at the pool? If he yeah. can't swim. With swim trunks on and his boat. With the boat. He lives at the pool. Like, and now he can't swim? But great misdirect, right? Because I 100% thought that Farmer was just being his crazy, psychozealous bodyguard. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a little much to, if, you know, if he's trying to rescue him from drowning, it's a little much to tackle him off the boat. But then you realize it was not because of the danger of him being on the water. It was because of the danger of him being on the boat. Like Frank already knew that the boat was rigged, right? I don't think so. I think if he didn't get the chance to tackle Fletcher then and there, he would have gotten out of reach. And, and if he had gotten out of the boat, he would have drowned before they could reach him because maybe that was the only boat or whatever. But it did seem overly dramatic. And I don't think that he knew that the boat, how would he know the boat was rigged? So there's two theories. Either he was tracking Fletcher's footsteps or he was tracking the footsteps of a stranger. And then he put two and two together moments before that somebody was there and probably for nefarious tampering purposes. Man, it's a good thing that bomb was rigged to like, OK, 45 seconds after the engine is started, when you're in the middle of the lake, that's when this thing blows. Uh, how are we going to get the boat back? Was that uh, Tony? No, Tony was gone. That was uh, what's his face? The limo driver. The other thing about the cabin that was where, so there were two lines I was mentioning that like unlocked secret chambers in my mind. 
One was when he goes nuts at the at the Florida hotel. Uh huh. On the kitchen staff. Yeah. <laughs> that, I heard and that the, in my head too. What did the, she say? Don't hurt my husband, please. Don't hurt my husband. I mean, that's exactly how she sounded, right? I'm not doing like some weird voice or whatever, but it was it rang clear in my mind. So, and the second one, since you seem like you're you're vibing with me on this, the second one is. It was Nikki. What does she say in a specific tone that's distinctly <laughs> Nikki? It was either I hate her or I was very stoned. <laughs> I, was very, I was very stoned. <laughs> I knew she was going to say that. But then there was also new, there was a new revelation about Nikki's confession. And that was if you need a hitman murderer, you find an Armando in East L.A. (laughs) And our mom found an Armando in East L.A. And that didn't turn out so great either. Her first husband. Are all Armandos from East L.A. bad news? I don't think so. I'm sure there are lovely Armandos. (laughs) And look. Anyway. Nikki meets a tragic end and seems to be disapproving of Farmer's relationship with her sister, Almost to a strangely creepy extent, I would say. Like, I'm pretty sure if there had been a sex scene, if Farmer and Marin really had hooked up, like, in the movie, Nikki definitely would have been watching, right? In some weird, (laughs) weird, creepy way. Because she was, she was like an obsessed sister. She was almost not a sister character. I I think I remember thinking it could be her sending the letters to try to scare her sister. But Michelle Lamar Richards, who played Nikki, um, I think thought was pretty one note until the cabin crying scene where Fletcher might have been killed on the boat. Then she's all like Viola Davis and crying and snotty. And then I thought she did really well. Like that was her standout scene. And of course, it was right before her death. Spoiler. They, yeah, she's mostly just portrayed as being kind of a creeper. And she minds Fletcher, so she's kind of tied down for a lot of the movie. But they ch- we check in with her an appropriate amount. I think we check in with all the characters. There's great reaction shots. We're always tied in with where Rachel is and what she's thinking. Like, the filmmakers really manage this cast of characters pretty well. I mean, she's always traveling in an entourage, so we're kind of always tracking like a group of people. And they're all featured. They're all incorporated. Likewise, the cinematography, I thought, was interesting, like panning to paintings or works of art. Like, it felt like there was a lot of forethought and intentionality to the directing and to the cinematography. And even though Nikki's character is kind of one notey, you know, at least we're consistently tracking that note. And hopefully it leads to a very realistic confession By the time you get to the cabin, you're like, yeah, Nikki, there's something off about Nikki. I I think the bodyguard was meant to be taken seriously. And if it has fault, it's maybe that it was so earnest. It was popular art. And then we get tired of that song after decades. Very Titanic-y in that way. I mean, not not as huge a success as Titanic, but a lot of the same kind of hallmarks. The bodyguard nowadays would 100% be PG-13. I mean, they didn't even use the R to great effect. Why is this movie rated R? She didn't need to, like, lash out at him and say that she wanted to have sex with him. Yeah. And, yeah, I agree. It was shot well, and it was shot commercially to great effect. It just, it had all the pieces of the blockbuster type of the time. You get the cheesy stuff, like the sword and stuff, which is so, like, the white guy with the ninja sword. That's pretty 90s, early 90s. But he takes her on their date to see Yojimbo. I've never understood dudes taking ladies to samurai movies as a date. Well, it makes them feel cultured and and exotic. Yeah. But I got Zatoichi blind swordsman vibes from the cabin scene, the the, the eyes closed shootout. Oh. And I wondered if that was... A samurai thing but i'm not sure that it was and that could be something that could be viewed as cheesy right like he seriously he does the closed eye training relying entirely hot. on little is it is it hot so in the hot. snow in the dark with a gun so hot but it seemed like they were going for an american ninja type vibe and i get that <laughs> that ninja and samurai are completely different but not to hollywood in the late 80s early 90s japanese samurai movie references and the bodyguard and titanic and I bring up Titanic only because we get to the romance pretty early 
in the bodyguard and they spend two thirds of the movie like circling each other and lashing out at each other. <laughs> there's like so there's like all this sexual tension and then there's all this like friction and they spend pretty much the majority of the movie not together, but kind of going through this adventure together. It's kind of Titanic y, right? I don't know. Girls love that stuff. <laughs> That's all you have to say about that? Like, I guess her diva-ness can be chalked up to the fact that she's an actual diva. But still, like, Rachel Marin is, is drama. Yeah. She's got death threats and people hounding her and the impenetrable wall of Cy and Devaney and Tony. And uh, she's got a little attitude. Have fun with that, Farmer. So you think Farmer's better off? You think he should just have that one last kiss and then move on like he planned to? I don't know. He's a tortured soul. He he almost lost Reagan. He lives in a basement with his sword. I don't think he lives. In, by the way, I don't think he lives there. I think that's his house. And he has a nice backyard where he sits and, you know, gets recruited. And then that was just like his, you know, man cave basement. <laughs> Why do you need a man cave if you live alone? I Because you want to have a place to put up your sword. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't think he lived in the basement. That's all. It's not like he lived in the basement of some family's home. No, but he might have had like a cheap basement apartment with no windows, with one door in or out that he could fortify. Well, where was that beautiful bedroom, that sun-drenched bedroom where they wake up after their romantic night together? Oh, yeah. No, that's right. That was at his house. Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, he is making bank. They continually re reinforced how much money he was making. So you're making the big bucks, man. You're making the big bucks, huh? Twenty five hundred. Come on, farmer. All right, three thousand. Oh, uh, farmer's making the big bucks. Three thousand ninety two, bro. That's good right. money. So he's doing pretty well for himself. He's not doing chartered jet well at the end or whatever, but he's fine. Does this make you want to watch Robin Hood? Does this make you want to see Yellowstone? I mean, Robin Hood is also on HBO Max, right? Ooh, next review. Oh, man, I'm going to hit you up. Dude. You're you're getting all this indulgent stuff. I'm going to find something good for you. Um, I'm guessing that you can tell that I really enjoyed revisiting The Bodyguard. I think this movie is meant to entertain. Uh, has its place in the 90s. And uh, no better testament to a movie's enduring quality than the fact that it's mocked later on. Like, it's still in the public consciousness, right? And Kevin Costner is a strange, reluctant star. But he is a hardworking, well-intentioned filmmaker and producer and director and actor. I like watching him in spite of the fact that I, I'm not sure he can act to save his life. He carries your favorite movie of all time. It's not my favorite movie of all time. And while he's on the cover, I can't say that Kevin Costner is the star or the person carrying or holding up JFK. Um, if you give The Bodyguard anything other than a totally, I'm going to say, no. <laughs> no. No. That should be the poster quote. The Bodyguard. No. <laughs> Come on, Wes. No, I refuse. Come on. Uh... Pretty cheesy, man. I have to dock a couple of points because it was also another terrible haircut movie. For who? For everybody. The stupid Steve McQueen, George Clooney haircut. Get out of here. She looked like a windblown poodle. That terrible little electrified He-Man Bob. Oh, he it was cute. I wasn't into the scrunchy look when she was going running, but otherwise I thought her hair was really cute. Nope. Very few Kevin Costner movies would get totallys from me. Now is the time. The award goes to... The Bodyguard. Your rating is? Official rating, all right movie. There's a reason that you haven't revisited this movie in th in almost 30 years. No good reason. It's your, your thing for Kevin Costner. Yeah. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right movie. Because The Bodyguard was fun to revisit. Eminently watchable, but you could also play on your phone while you're watching it and look up for the good bits. The Bodyguard gets a uh, totally from Iris. That's not part of your rating system. An all right from Wes, a totally from Iris. That is our review on The Bodyguard. I'd really like to know, do you think that Farmer knew that the boat was rigged? 818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com. Wes, if people really like our podcast, how do they support us? Support us on Patreon, obviously, is the way that best serves us to keep bringing you quality content. But we'd be happy with some listens and some likes and some follows on Instagram. Not to mention subscriptions wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Boom. And I... <laughs> That's pretty good.